brain loves novelty, and this is what sparks the learners who have no need to know. And I use this little story to explain this. I was, at a, I was doing a PD for a district, and it was in the summertime, and the teachers were all there, and one of them had brought her daughter, who I guess she didn't have a sitter. She was very well behaved. She was sitting on her mom's lap, playing with her phone. And she only looked up a couple times during the time that I was there. It was about a five-hour PD. She looked up once when we did a color experiment, and then she looked up again when she heard something weird, which was me going, ah. And she saw me holding this, and she heard that unusual inflection, she saw the body gesture, so she looked up. Now she was only about maybe just turned four, so she had no idea what we were talking about. But what was interesting is, after the break, when they came back, I said to this little girl, I'm gonna call her Lulu, I said, Lulu, can you tell me what these letters say? Now her mom immediately jumped in and said, oh, she's only just turned four, she knows her name, but we haven't worked on letters yet, and she's, she's just, we're gonna work on that this year because she starts kindred. And I said, it's just an experiment, I'm just curious. So I said, can you tell me what these letters say? And she went, ah. Now she didn't know what a letter was, but she saw this and a sound popped out of her mouth. That's a stepping stone to what later can become decoding. Because that's all decoding is. See a symbol, sound pops out. Now after break, we took another little time, came back, and I actually put some things on a wall. I put about 10 different patterns on a wall. And I went up to Lulu and I said, Lulu, can you go show me the letters that go, Ah, uh, and so this time she had to do the reverse. She had to hear the sound and find the symbol that makes it. That's what a writer has to do. When you're encoding a word that you want to write, you have to hear the sound and immediately know what letter choices you have to put down on that paper. And she was able to immediately find this from that sound. Now she's not going to use that yet to read with it and to write with it, but she has it. She can access it. She can own it and retrieve it. And she was interested enough to get it not because it was pertinent, she had a use for it to read a book or a word like Johnny, but because we use these tricks. Novelty, the brain loves novelty. If you have an, a body gesture that's unusual, a vocal inflection that changes, your guys that are ELL learners, you know, they tune out half of what you say if you sound like the, the Snoopy teacher, the Charlie Brown, blah, 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 blah. But when they hear, ah, or when they see a, an extreme body gesture, you get their attention. Now, what you do with that attention's key, and that's what we used when she looked up, I was ready for her attention. Now, what's interesting is looking at the brain and where this lies. The brain develops back to front. The back part of the brain is the social emotive center. So that's the feeling network. That part is highly developed when learners come to pre-K. They already know how it feels when no one wants to play with them. They know how it feels when they get to be the line leader. You don't have to teach that part of the brain. There's a, there's a social emotive awareness that learners develop far before they come to us. The higher level processing is the front area of the brain, the executive processing center. That is a, a landmine trap for struggling upper grade learners and for early grade learners half the time it's not even built. I mean, you're, you're the dead wasteland. <laughs> so the higher level processing center is the area of the brain that actually is supposed to tune in and take part and pull these skills. And for a lot of learners, it's a part of the house that's either not built or there hasn't been good foundation laid for them to get to those networks proficiently. So when we sneak things in the back door, we're talking about that social emotive affective learning domain, taking advantage of that intelligence that lies there, which in this case, this AUAW, that is being stored and retrieved in the part of the brain that attends to social feedback and feels embarrassed. That's what these little arrows show right here. So the part of the brain that makes you feel embarrassed or that attends to social feedback is the area of the brain that we have tricked into storing this information. And brain plasticity is what allows us to do this. Um, brain plasticity means that, you can, that your brain will naturally reassign responsibilities to stronger areas to circumvent areas of weakness that no longer can function or, or take in those tasks. If we know that the brain has the ability to kind of reroute where things are housed, then we can help that process along by disguising content in such a way as to trick a stronger area to take it in and keep it. That way it's there and it's accessible and ready to be used by learners who maybe wouldn't be ready to learn it, but they can certainly be handed it.